In any case, friends, if you have your Bibles, join me in John chapter 21. And as we saw, Jesus meets his disciples. They were out fishing all night and didn't catch a thing. And he calls out to them. He said, hey, try tossing your nets on the other side. They did that and they caught a lot of fish. And at that point, Peter says, it's the Lord. Jumps in the water, swims to shore. And there, Jesus has a breakfast prepared for them. They eat. And then in verse 15, we see this dialogue this interaction between Jesus and Peter. Verse 15 says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my land. He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, friends, when we look at this passage, we have this uh, clarity. So whether we had, you know, at first we had the orientation where Peter could clearly declare who Jesus was, we saw the disorientation where in the midst of that he thought he knew, but we saw him mess up time and time again, putting his foot into his mouth, that disorientation. But now in this moment we see a reorientation where Jesus reinstalls him in his plan. He puts him back up as a leader in this movement. He says, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Feed uh, my sheep. Now, did you may have noted that three times Jesus asked the question. And he gave Peter a chance to respond three times. Now, many of you may have gone quickly to that place. How many times did Peter deny Jesus that fateful night? Three times. Friends, this whole scene is meant to show us Peter as completely restored. Jesus still intends to use him. Jesus still intends to have Peter be the rock on which he will build his church. That declaration that he made to Peter in Caesarea Philippi didn't get eliminated simply because Peter didn't get it. Because Peter became disoriented. No, even though three times he denied his Lord, now he was affirmed three times. And friends, did you see that three times he was commissioned to care for the flock? I think that this would have rippled out from Peter to the disciples. Whatever the mistakes of the past, Jesus was restoring Peter to a place of trust. Now, I think the tone here is important. Jesus' invitation is clear. It's firm. There's no wavering. You don't see Jesus saying, now, Peter, if that's true, you can go ahead and feed my lambs. No, it's, it's clear, it's firm, the tone is set. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus invited Peter back into that position. It's a fresh challenge, it's a new commission. It's time to learn how to be a shepherd. It's time to feed the lambs and sheep and to look after them. Now, friends, the second point that we see here. I, I think sometimes when we think about Peter's declaration of love for Jesus, we kind of just assume it to be the case. We think it's, well, it's a, there's an abundance of love there. But I want to tease this out a little bit. We see that Peter's actions and his language all over the previous weeks reveal that Peter didn't want a crucified Lord. He had a sense of what he wanted in a Messiah. We see that as he chides Jesus and he says, no, Lord, never. You'll never be crucified. We see that as he draws his sword at Peter at Jesus' arrest and lops off the ear of the prison guard. He had an idea of what the Messiah was. And it was his own idea. 
Peter's actions showed that he did not want a crucified Lord. But Jesus was, in fact, crucified. His arms were stretched and his hands were nailed to the cross and he was raised up on a hill called Golgotha. So I wonder if there was a real question of where Peter's devotion actually stood in light of this. When Jesus enters Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, Peter's right there at his side. Yeah, Lord, I love this Messiah. I love this Jesus. But the crucified Jesus? There's question. Was Peter ready to love Jesus as he truly was, not as Peter wished him to be? And I think this is an important question, and Peter must face it and answer it. Now, friends, Lots of people claim to love Jesus. But I think the question echoes ahead to us. Are they ready to love Jesus as he truly is and not as they wish him to be? The real Jesus was a faithful Jew. The real Jesus preached about and sought the kingdom of God breaking through into the world. The real Jesus broke down lines of religiosity. The real Jesus had time for anyone who honestly sought truth, but especially those who are poor and marginalized. And often because life has tilled the soil of their lives, they were the ones that were ready to stop playing games and to follow Jesus with all of themselves. The real Jesus didn't pursue power and control, but a peacemaking love. The real Jesus invited people to follow him. Friends, when we see Peter having to wrestle with this question, do you love me, the crucified Christ, not just me as you've developed me in, in your mind, the me of Messiah, the me of uh, the one that would free you from your oppressors, me as I am, that question ripples ahead to us. Are we ready to love Jesus as he is and not as we wish him to be? A Jesus of our own making. Friends, there's a third note here as we work it through. As I mentioned earlier, this is a clear restoration of Peter. It's a commissioning of him. And I think, again, it should be seen in that context of his denial three times on the night of his arrest. But I also think it's important that the one thing that Jesus questioned Peter about was his love, was his love. He didn't re make him reaffirm who he said he was up in Caesarea Philippi. He didn't need him to confirm the belief about who Jesus is. He didn't test Peter on his understanding of what had been playing out these weeks. He didn't test him on his doctrine. He didn't test him on his rhetorical skill or his capability in exegeting the scriptures, mining it for truth. None of these things. The one thing Jesus asked Peter about, love, love. Friends, do you see that in this, the basic qualification for Christian service is love? That's it. That's it. Across this stream, no matter where you find yourself in, I think that's something that, given the time, given the space, given the, the posture, all of us could find ourselves able to love another. And this is all it takes to be seen in a leadership role in the kingdom of God. And this is the secret of Christian ministry, right? I'm gonna tell you about it, it's not about study. It's not about knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, able to uh, kind of rhetorically explain it. It's not about being a social justice warrior. Friends, it's about love, as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, we've talked about this in the past. After our time together, I want you to go and read that once again. 1 Corinthians 13, and be reminded that the secret to Christian ministry, to loving God well and loving others well, is that idea of love. Now, some of us have experienced some life. Some of us have a hardened heart. 
Some of us have some brokenness that we're navigating, but friends, I think that somewhere deep down inside all of us, there is a love. There is a love. And when we put that love towards Jesus, even though we've let him down enough times, more times than we can count, he wants to find that love. And he wants to give you a chance to express it. To heal the hurts and failures of the past and then, like Peter, give you something new to do. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now, friends, the work that you're given, that you're invited into, is not about earning forgiveness. Nothing can ever do that. Relationship with God, any salvation embraced, any faith and life that is full, that is experienced, is about grace. From start to finish, it's an outpouring of God's love for us. The work you're invited to is out of the joy and the relief that you're already forgiven. It's work we can dive into freely as a sign that we are forgiven. And friends, this work for Christ will sometimes be costly because Jesus' own work was utterly costly. It took his very life. As we do the work Jesus gives us to do, it could mean following Jesus into suffering and perhaps even death. We get to express love. We get to walk in love, even through pain and hardship and maybe even to death. This is where Jesus goes with this conversation with Peter. He says in verse 18, Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And then John puts a little comment here, a little uh, uh, a comment. And he says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he goes back to Jesus and he said, Then Jesus said to him, Follow me. Follow me. Take care of my sheep, feed my lambs. Peter will complete his task as a shepherd, caring for the flock of Christ by laying down his own life for the sheep. According to church tradition, Peter himself was crucified upside down in Rome roughly 30 years after Jesus' ministry. It's been noted that within sort of the early church, that line to stretch out your hands was sort of a euphemism for crucifixion. So we see Jesus saying, Peter, you're going to be crucified for me. Do you still love me? Do you still love me? And he ends with that, follow me. If you love me, follow me. If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, love one another. Notice that follow me, it comes full circle to Jesus' initial invitation to his disciples. When he first met Simon Peter fishing, he said, follow me. And Peter had followed. He had dropped his nets. He had stepped out of the boat and he declared him to be the Christ. He followed him up the mountain. Then again, on the garden, on the night Jesus was crucified, he followed him all the way. But friends, we know he hadn't followed continuously. We know he denied him. With the, he, but here we see that with the words that Jesus used to call Peter originally, he used them to affirm Peter. Keep on following me. Keep on following me. Keep on following me. Friends, I hope we see in this restoration of Peter a clear uh, invitation for ourselves when we drop the ball, when we sin, when we are disobedient, acting against the purposes of God in the world. It's not the end of the story. There is with repentance, with a turning, with a declaration of love. 
a restoration awaiting for us and an invitation to walk once again in step with the purposes of Christ that are playing out in the world. We're invited to participate again in what God is up to. Living each day with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Friends, I want to invite you to continue on this journey. When Jesus says to Peter, follow me, I want you to hear that. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus today and every day.